boldly engaging the mindless propaganda of our time, apparently with reason. This is Rage of the Age. This is Rage of the Age, and we have with us today the official historian at Scrooby Manor, the vice chair of the Pilgrim Fathers UK Origins Association. She's the author of numerous books about the Pilgrims to include historical fictional novels. She's involved with several documentaries about the Pilgrims to include Monumental and Pilgrims. And she has released her recent book called In the Shadow of Men, a book about Pilgrim women from the Pilgrims. I want to introduce to you today, Sue Allen. Sue, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's a real delight to be here with you. It's a delight to have you. Um, when I told my family that you was going to uh, be on with me today, they were in first disbelief and then shock and then uh, maybe envious. I don't know. We, uh, we <laughs> loved seeing you in the various documentaries that you've been in, such as Monumental and uh, The Pilgrims. Um, getting to know, to know more about you, it seems that this is more than just a passing interest for you. It's almost like um, an obsession. <laughs> You're like really immersed into this subject. Has that always been the case or is this like a recent infection you got? It really is an obsession. And um, it began about 18 years ago when I moved mm. to Lincolnshire, found out the connections to my new home, to the Pilgrims. And that was it. I'm hooked. But I didn't like the gaps that were in the story, in the narrative. And so hmm. I now turn to research. I have to know more. I have to fill those gaps. So now I'm better known for my pilgrim research. Yes. What were some of the gaps that like really struck out to you initially? Well, there's so many. Yeah. But the biggest one, I think, is actually concerning the women, because we don't know where many of them came from, their families. In some instance, amongst the pilgrims, we don't even know their given family name before they married. It's as if they've been washed out of the story. They're, they're just silent partners, and that's wrong. Um, without women, we only get half the story. That, that can't be right. And that's sort of what you were trying to, I guess, alleviate in your new release of uh, In the Shadows of Men, where you covered a biography of the information you can gather of some of those women. Well, actually, the book is full of new research. It's mm -hmm. full of information that we didn't know about these women. And uh, I always thought that history books have been around about the pilgrims for over 150 years. I assumed that the women had been researched right, and was horrified to find out that they hadn't because most of the historians were men and had dismissed them. And so by looking at the women, I am finding more and more incredible connections and links between the group as a whole, mm. which, which we would never have known about. So it, it's an ongoing project. I think this will probably see me out. There's so much to do. <laughs> there seems to be quite a bit to it. Now, um, I know when we were initially talking and I mentioned them as Puritans, you were quick to give me a, a rebuttal about that. Like, no, they are separatists. Um, uh, so let's, let's work with the clarifications of terms uh, so I don't get further hurt in talking with you about this. But there's a, uh, so I understand a separatist is leaving the church, Puritan, where to purify the church. Are they not necessarily the same people? Well, they sort of began the same. The, the, the problem really began when we go back to the reign of Queen Elizabeth. Hmm. When Elizabeth came to the throne, her predecessor, Mary, her half-sister, had been Catholic. So the whole country was Catholic. But before Mary, her brother Edward had been bells and whistles Protestant. <laughs> when Elizabeth came to the throne, she settles the church. Remember, she's the head of the church. The monarch right. is the head of the church. She settled it not in the way that her brother had purified, if you like, and reformed the church in England. She had this meddle-maddle church 
In fact, John Knox warned his followers in England to have nothing to do with it because it was a stinking pile of old works. Mm. It wasn't Protestant. It wasn't Catholic. Right. <laughs> and this is what caused the problem. Many people had given their lives for the Protestant faith in England under Mary in the hope that one day they would get their Reformed Church back. And when they didn't, it caused this upset. And anyone harking back to those days and wanting that purified church and not liking Elizabeth's settlement at all were given this name that you could spit out like a curse. It was Puritan, mm. and that's where the term came from. In Elizabeth's reign, it, there aren't separatists until the end of her reign. Most people who are harking back are trying to change the church by stealth from within. They're given the name Puritan. It isn't until 1592 when it's, there's an act where it's, it's illegal to be a Puritan. And mm. they're carrying on um, by stealth, if you like to change the Church of England. And this is where we have people like Richard Clifton, like James Brewster, the brother of Pilgrim William Brewster. They're just being very naughty boys in the churches that they run. <laughs> they are not using a Book of Common Prayer, which Elizabeth says you have to. They're not wearing the vestments because, after all, in the Bible, where's Jesus wearing his vestments and his cap? They're not making the sign of the cross at baptism because it's not in the Bible. Basically, these folk were Bible Christians. If it wasn't in the Bible, it had no place in their church. So in that respect, for a while, Puritans and then those who will become separatists, there isn't really that line until we get a chap called Robert Trouble Church Brown. Trouble there, church, how appropriate. <laughs> there's, there's a clue there. Yes. <laughs> who start to teach, well, you know, this church isn't going to change. Let's skedaddle. Let's leave it. It's an unclean thing. Let's leave it and mm. let's have our own congregations. But there's a problem with that. If you decide you're going to leave the Church of England, the head of the church is monarch. Mm -hmm. Turning your back on the monarch sounds very much like treason. Now, that's something that um, a lot of my American listeners can't fathom, because that's not a part of our uh, national DNA, as you will. Uh, I I'm assuming that's still the case, technically, right? That the monarch is still the head of the Church of England in England? Is that is that true? Not technically. They are okay. the head. They are. Okay. So that's still an established thing. And they're the head of the church. So in the term separatist, then, it's it's not that they're just deciding, I want to leave this church and start another. It's viewed as actual, like, treason, right? It could be viewed that way. You can imagine hmm. that uh, the monarch wasn't very pleased about that. And in fact, when King James comes to the throne, he really clamps down on these nonconformists because they don't want they want their own churches they don't want bishops and the, the king was right he said well no bishops the next thing is no king that's right <laughs> we're going to stamp them out now, now this king james if i'm correct is also the uh the one who commissioned the king james bible yes yes uh, <laughs> how how ironic <laughs> well not really because in the reign of Henry VIII, Bibles in English for the first time were being smuggled into the country. This is what yes. fuels the Reformation. These Bibles were translated by Tyndale, William Tyndale. Mm. And if you look at the King James Bible, I think it's about 90% Tyndale's Bible. Mm -hmm. Right. So, yes. The no, Bible I, I just see the... I just see the humor in it because um, uh, sometimes I bump elbows with circles that are all like very defensive about the King James Bible as being like the only real version you're ever allowed to use <laughs> with their churches. 
And if they just heard some of the history behind King James himself, I wonder if maybe it would alter their view of, because <laughs> this is the guy of like, I'm right and I'm the head of the church and um, you can put whatever that Bible you want, but if it contradicts me, then it's not going in there sort of idea, you know? James was a divine monarch. He believed that he was God given and nothing yes. was going to change that. The only difference really between Tyndale's Bible and James's Bible is the language. And you'll find that certain things are stilted towards authority. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't the Bible of choice of our pilgrims that still remained the Geneva Bible, which in essence was Tyndale's translation. Yeah, I was going to ask you if that was, because uh, I've heard that, that the pilgrims came with the Geneva Bible, not King James's Bible. And I wanted to verify that with you, the, yeah. the obsessive expert today, <laughs> if that was the case. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm an interested party. I don't yes, see myself an as an expert. <laughs> uh, I actually have a Geneva Bible. I read it out of curiosity because of yeah. the under learning that the pilgrims used that. Um, and I don't see too many differences between the translations here and there. I think it's the commentary that set King James off the most, wasn't it? The commentary. If you look at the Geneva Bible, it's a study Bible because mm -hmm. it's got study notes with it, if you like. Right. So you might be in a cave somewhere and you can still grow spiritually because this mm. Bible, that's the difference. Right. Now, they're called pilgrims. Uh, getting back to terms again. Uh, is this because you said Puritan made it sound like a derogatory term given to them. Was pilgrim the same way or is this something they called themselves? Where did that term come from? Well, I think it really goes from a saying you can find of Bradford's um, in his of Plymouth Plantation, that they knew they were pilgrims. But if you're looking at the separatists on the Mayflower, then really they would have recognized themselves as saints. That's not uh -huh. picking themselves up. It's because right. they were following Christ's word. And then everyone else was considered strangers, right? Yes, because the strangers were exactly that. You have our pilgrim congregation who by that time had been in Leiden in fact they've mm. been in exile in Holland for 12 years right and leaving for the new world to start well not really to start a colony but to have somewhere to settle where they could be free of that interference from the Church of England where they right. could just be and uh, at the very last moment the Merchant adventurers foisted onto them almost an equal number of folk who weren't separatists. And this is where they get the term strangers. And this is where some of the trouble begins. Right. Yeah. You, you mentioned Holland in Leiden. Leiden, I'm not, I'm not sure how, which way it's pronounced, but the, uh, that's a chapter that was new to me when I discovered that. And I'm convinced many Americans who learn this pilgrim story, that part's almost left out. That whole, that whole exodus in the middle, if you will, of going to Holland. Can, can you highlight a little bit of that, of why it led? Why would they go to Holland, and then why did they leave Holland, and, and how's that part of the story? Well, the situation in England had been getting pretty bad for our separatists. Um, they, first of all, had their clergy sacked from their churches so they could no longer go and listen to their clergy who may have been preaching within the church of england until they lost their livings this happened after the hampton court conference instigated by james in 1604 and what do you do you march with your feet you leave mm -hmm. your church you don't attend the only reason you are attending because you have a clergyman who's given you a very legal but reformed service. He becomes wanted for standing up against the state. You no longer go to church, which is compulsory. So you become wanted. Mm. You have to escape England. And the only place you could really go is, um, now let's see, we could go to France. Oh, no, it's Catholic. <laughs> Spain? No. Nope. Right. The only place open to them was Holland. <clears throat> Now, the, uh, the the compulsory attendance, that was like, a, there was actual punishments associated with that, right? It's not like a slap on the wrist, was it? 
No, um, the fines in the beginning would have been like a slap in the wrist, you know, perhaps mm. a shilling for non-attendance. But the more you didn't attend, the more you ended up paying, you know, in mm. some cases, £20. When you mm. think that £20 is, it, it is an awful lot of money back then. Yes. You can't keep affording to do that. But like you say, if the slap on the wrist isn't going to make you change your mind, the next step is prison. Mm. And there were arrest warrants out for William Brewster and his friend and companion at Scrooby Manor, Richard Jackson, the father of pilgrim Susanna White, who had arrest warrants pending for them and had to escape their own their own homes for mm. prison was not prison was not somewhere you wanted to be no <laughs> because prison in itself was usually a death sentence ah yes the conditions were so bad right so you can go in there for something small but still You'll pay die. with your life right yeah wow uh, was there a long-standing tie with Holland because of the Protestant faith? Were there a lot of interconnections between those two nations? Well, not a lot of people know this, but William Brewster once worked for a man called William Davidson. Now, William Davidson was Secretary of State at the end of his career. Mm. But before that, he was a diplomat and often went to Holland for Elizabeth. Hmm. And he managed to broker an agreement which goes way back to the 1570s, which stated wherever the English were, and the only English abroad at that time were mainly merchants, mm -hmm. they had the freedom to worship according to their faith. Mm. And these were mainly the merchant churches in Holland. And this agreement was signed by everyone on behalf of Elizabeth. But what Davidson didn't say was that he had a hand in setting up many of these merchant churches along Presbyterian lines. Oh, wow. she, she would have had a fit if she'd known. Because yeah. <laughs> that's, that's more particularly tied to Scotland, right? No, it, the Presbyterian polity uh, is, is, is what John Calvin laid down. It's more or less oh. it's more or less the pattern that okay. our pilgrims followed, where you have a, a preacher, a teacher, elders, mm. and they're all chosen by the congregation. So they're very similar. Oh, so her her issue with it would be, like you said, the polity. It wasn't top down Episcopal in nature like her church. This was one where they're kind of independent in a way, right? Yes, Puritan. Pure <laughs> <laughs> Elizabeth would have been mad if she'd known, but she didn't uh, realize. Yeah, so these terms are spinning my head. So, okay, so Presbyterian <laughs> is technically Puritan, and then you have Puritans who are Puritans. You have Separatists who may be Puritans. Was it just an all-catching term to yeah. reform England's church, basically? Puritan was wanting to reform the church. Mm -hmm. Those who followed Troubled Church Brown got this name Brownist which was right. even derogatory when spoken by a Puritan. Oh, wow. <laughs> Puritans thought if you want to change the church, you have to stay within it. After right. all, what's the best way to flavor a stew? Be one of the ingredients. Yes. Whereas the separatists got to the point where they said, no, we have to step outside of this mm -hmm. for our own sakes. So was there a tension between... Um the hardcore separatists and the Puritans who didn't want to leave the church? Was there an animosity there at times? There was once our separatists had left England, once the Scrooby congregation with John Robinson had left for Holland, there mm -hmm. were pamphlets written by Puritans, which were very derogatory. Wow. They, you know, as saying that the separatists were cowardly, you know, for leaving the country. What they would have preferred was them to stay behind and perhaps be martyred or something like that for the cause. <laughs> so, Why didn't you get martyred? <laughs> Why not? Yeah. Oh, uh, wow. <laughs> you have um, 
th- these Puritans and the separatists fighting with the church. I, I, and the Puritans themselves, I guess, those who wanted to stay with the church, I think highlight what many of us maybe don't understand. Uh, again, I'm coming from an American perspective. Um, in churches there, you, I believe they would have something called the homily of obedience to the king or something like that, where from a very early age, you were taught to reverence the king and to not cross, to do no harm to your king, to, to, to even that even means the, the church you attend, right? You obeyed the king. Right. The, the king was the absolute power. Mm-hmm. Um, going against the king was, was quite a, a serious matter. But you're looking at this difference between pilgrims, uh, separatists and Puritans. Look at one of the pilgrims, William Mm -hmm. Brewster. His own brother was a Puritan minister. Mm -hmm. He would not leave the church. I think the reason being that his ministry was not complete. There was so much work to do in his own parish, Mm -hmm. which which were quite rowdy that he thought it was his duty to perhaps stay and minister to them. So it would have torn a lot of the ministers. Right. I have my own flock hmm. who may not have separatist tendencies. Right. You might, but mm-hmm. their souls are your concern. Mm-hmm. So it was a hard choice. You're listening to Rage of the Age. Rage of the Age. Politics, religion, economics, and history with a conservative bend. Hey, I imagine this wasn't an easy black or white choice for many. Uh, there's so much layered into that type of decision. Because, uh, I mean, when they go to Holland, I mean, they're technically English. But while they're living there, they're not in an English surrounding if you will and and they'll maybe begin to adopt ways of the dutch or become dutch perhaps uh and change an attitude uh and that might you know alter the way you think about even going to to holland wouldn't it you don't find this with the adults who are steadfast Mm. in their faith but certainly the concern is the young people growing up and being influenced by their peer group who are dutch Mm -hmm. This is where the real worry came, that the younger folk were losing their identity and the Dutch teenagers were were much freer and had bad ways, some of them. You didn't want your children to adopt their ways, their attitudes, not after you'd given up your home, Mm -hmm. your occupations, you've lived as refugees. What would be the point? Yeah. And their souls would be lost along the way. No, mm-hmm. you want to keep yourselves together. So although they're in Holland, and of course they would have had friends amongst the Dutch, mm-hmm. they keep this endogamous relationship amongst themselves where you only marry like. You keep mm-hmm. yourself together in your own community because you are English. Mm-hmm. But you're in a country where Perhaps there's going to be war again with the Spanish. Yeah. You don't want to be in a war. You can't return to England for many of the folk. They can't. They want it. So the only opportunity they have to remain English is in an English colony. And that's now, Is that one of their motivations that then led them to I often ponder that if they already gotten away and went to another place that was already established and it's Protestant? And you're allowed to observe your faith, you know, you know, what would propel them? Hey, let's go to this land. No one's been really been to much before. Uh, chances of survival slim. Let's give it a shot. I mean, was this one of the primary drives that was the, pushing them? The situation in Holland was changing. Hmm. War would have been terrible if there'd been war with Spain. Mm-hmm. There had been war before. Right. Spanish were Catholic. They massacred Dutch Protestants. Mm-hmm. You don't want to be caught up in that. Right. Um, you can't come back to England. You want to keep your identity. So, yeah, if the opportunity came to go to the new world, um, that would be a solution. But it wasn't an easy one. Um, no. Not at all. 
So, and, and that solution, I often wonder this just in my head, because it seems that they, they dealt with uh, English venturists or uh, uh, I don't know if they're venture capitalists of the day or whatnot, but. Uh, uh, Let's call them users. Yeah, users yeah. and abusers. <laughs> they, Financial yeah. users. <laughs> so they, they, they get in league with them to work out some kind of deal to go establish this colony. Um, I. I could they have not done that with the Dutch who were, who had, uh, I don't know, seemed at the time to me a little more enterprising in their overseas ventures than maybe the English were, or did they, they, or they just determined to that, make something English? That's that there was, there was overtures made, uh, to be a part of a, a of a, a, a Dutch expedition, but oh, that fell through. Really? So okay. in the end, you know, the English option presented itself and, that's what they took. Wow. You know, nice a nice trip to Virginia. <laughs> Virginia. <laughs> That's where they were going. Right. So they were originally supposed to head to, was it Jamestown then they were heading to or some other they location? Were, they were heading for Virginia. Now, Virginia at that time was a huge, a huge area. It goes mm -hmm. almost up to the, you know, New York, down to almost North Carolina. So the so whole area was Virginia. Massive. That was that was Virginia. Wow. Wow. So okay. but the advantage was going to Virginia, mm -hmm. you would know that at one point there is an English colony nearby that you can get support from. Right. Which wasn't the case when they ended up in New England. Right. Which is where they did end up. But uh so on that trip. Not all of them got to go because apparently there was two vessels. You had the, the Speedwell, which didn't work out, and you had the Mayflower, which is quite popularly known. Uh, so not everyone got to make that trip. About how many of the original pilgrims then made the trip across to the New World? Well, you're, you're talking about the Speedwell. Of course, that was their own ship that they bought ah. um, in Holland and left from Delft Haven to come and meet with the Mayflower. So the idea was to have that ship. It was independence. They could use it for fishing. It was ah. their lifeline. So they're going to take it with them and keep it. They were taking it with them ah. to keep it. Okay. But it developed problems mm. once they'd left Southampton and put into Dartmouth to try to repair it. Mm. In fact, the ship was probably perfectly seaworthy, but the sailors hired to take it across may have actually overrigged it, you know, uh, sabotaged it in some way. So because they would still be paid. But oh, of course, wow. when wow. that happened and they left it behind, there wasn't enough room for everyone. So you're right. Some had to be left behind. And in fact, some who had been on the Speedwell, when it had been taking on lots of water and looked like it was going to sink, might have thought, you know what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That would have been wanna... me. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe Holland's all right. I don't... <laughs> but then if you look at the number of passengers aboard the Mayflower, and there were 102, half were strangers and roughly okay. half were our separatists. So it's about okay. even. So you uh, say roughly 50 uh, of the, the pilgrims, as we would call them, are making this trip then to the uh, to the yeah. new world. Uh, so they 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 get to the new world. They're off course. They land up uh, in Massachusetts, looking for Virginia. <laughs> um, and but the interesting thing I have learned that this this area had been visited before by uh, the English, even before they got there. If not settled, there had been other incursions. I suppose trading, raiding, whatever they're doing there, uh, going on. Fishing. fishing. Okay. It was a well-known place to go and fish for cod. So, oh. yeah, fishing, trade, and mapping. John Smith of Jamestown fame had actually been there mapping the area. Oh, wow. Wow. But it it was a bad trip, though, <laughs> that they took because they left at, like, the possibly the worst time to, to take a trip across the Atlantic in yeah. that age. Yes, because they'd, they'd left much earlier at a sensible time, but with all the delays with the Speedwell, it's a couple of months before they're actually off 
And at the beginning of September, it's not a good time to be crossing the Atlantic, as you say. So they did hit an awful lot of storms. And in fact, halfway across, their main beam broke in a storm, which must have been absolutely terrifying. Because yes. if you've got that main beam holding up your decks and it cracks, the water's coming in. Right. But they managed to repair that. There was a house jack on board and they managed to jack it up and do a running repair. But uh, it must have been absolutely terrifying. And when you think there was a huge number of children on board as well and mothers and pregnant women, it, well, mm -hmm. it would have been so frightening. Did you have some give birth while on that voyage? Yes, we have. Um, we have one child being born. Um, okay. it, it's Stephen Hopkins' child, uh, Stephen and Elizabeth Hopkins' child, and they call him Oceanus. <laughs> Oceanus. Which, <laughs> which is lovely. Appropriate, and, yes. Uh, th there's one child lost, one stillbirth, and oh. another birth shortly after arrival, and that's Susanna White has a child, and they call him Peregrine, which means wanderer or pilgrim. Aha, look at there. <laughs> but, but to be pregnant, to be so far pregnant and mm. stepping onto a ship. Right. It's not like they figured out on the way, hey, I'm pregnant. No. <laughs> they, knew, they knew ahead of time. They, they were in yeah. the last trimester of their pregnancy. Right. So they were so brave. Yes, absolutely. Because it's not like nowadays you get on an ocean liner and just, you know, kind of chill till you get there. This was some serious travel. <laughs> some hardship endured uh, to get from one place to another. It's not like getting on an ocean liner and you actually know you're going to get yeah. there. Yeah. <laughs> there, there, had, there had been a group of separatists who had set sail for Virginia mm -hmm. and not that long before our group. They oh, really? Set, and they almost all died. Did they make it to where they were going? No. They almost all died on the way across. So, so most of them died. The rest kind of were rescued later or something. Or? They, they, they made it, but there was sickness on that ship. Ah. Uh, so you can imagine tales of that. Well, so and so went, and they all mm -hmm. died. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a done deal. Wow. So, so when they get to the land, I'm sure they were really happy to see the land, but it's not like their troubles were over. <laughs> they were just beginning in a way. I said this to somebody from New England, and I said, oh. I wonder, well, what do you think, you know, they felt like when they spied New England in November? <laughs> yes. Yes, they said probably. <laughs> <laughs> if you've ever been there, then you know, yeah. Wow, look at the wall of snow. Yeah. <laughs> and it's freezing cold. And, and, and you're going to try yeah. to make a settlement. Right. right. Wow. But, um, and I, I guess this ties into to the way they thought, though. The way things played out, even though it was rough, they still saw this as what they would call the providence of God, right? Yes, very much so. Everything was in God's plan. They were right. in his hands, and their faith would see them through that's what they believed and they had to believe because mm -hmm. i when i when i look at the the events as i understand them unfolding it's almost as if there's a hand there at times because that village was you know not decimated if this uh th this guy who used to live there suddenly didn't show up who happened to speak english and you know and all these events the corn right. being buried there that they find i mean take one yeah. of them out and this whole venture could have been not even a history story, you know what yeah. I mean? Yes, it, it should never, it, they should never have lived. You know, if you, if you were looking at this today as a game of survival, you would mm. say at the outset, oh no, they're all gone. Yeah. They're not gone. <laughs> <laughs> they're goners. Game, game no over. <laughs> I mean, every possible disadvantage, they get there at the yeah. worst time. I yeah. mean, because they have to grow their own food, they have to wait till spring. Yeah. They're in an area where, you know, um, there has been sickness, but there's still some hostile natives that fought with one another and would fight with them, uh, that are potential threats. Uh, they don't necessarily have an established link with England per se. No, they're uh, running out of food. Well, England, right. England doesn't know where they are until right. <laughs> the spring and the ship goes back. 
<laughs> right. No one knows where they are. Yeah, as far as they know, maybe they sunk or something yeah. to the, the bottom of the ocean. So um, let's talk about the the Thanksgiving, though, that took place that, you know, in American minds, we, we maybe blow it up bigger than it is. But um, I guess the idea where that came from, that Thanksgiving, what, what event took place that kind of lends to that legend, if you will? Well, you know, it in England, we always give thanks for a harvest. Here it's called mm. a harvest festival. It goes way back in Holland. They had a tradition of giving thanks. So it mm. would have been something very much in their psyche. We have got a harvest. It might not have been the best harvest in the world, but you give thanks for that. God has provided it. And the fact that they were joined then by the Native Americans bringing food as well. And I think that's what makes this memorable. So it was generally a Thanksgiving to, to celebrate the provision that God had given. And, and I guess their neighbors joined in and their allies, some of them were allies, yeah. they joined in uh, celebrating this great feast. So, I mean, I guess it's kind of like we would picture a Thanksgiving, I guess, right? Yeah. Yes, it's, it's, it's rather Disney-fied now. Disney-fied, of course. <laughs> it would have been a genuine outpouring of thanks after yes. all that had happened, all mm. those deaths that winter before, the hopefulness, the running out of food and waiting for food to grow, right. the, the thankfulness that they could fish, that they mm. could hunt, and that they had this um, this interaction with the natural people there, which mm. really, without that, that they really would have been gone. It was a good cause to give. They had so much to be thankful for. Right. How many were alive by that? Do, do, can we determine how many were left alive after going through all that, that harsh winter, waiting for the food to come? And, and now they're at this Thanksgiving event. How many were left from the original group of the pilgrims? Well, from the whole group, the whole 102 okay. passengers. Mm -hmm. There's about half alive. Wow. There, there were 18 married women at the beginning of that journey, and mm. there are only five are left the, wow. after the winter, and by the time of that Thanksgiving, there's only four women left, and there's a huge number of children who are orphaned right, or, or whose parents one has died or both have died mm -hmm. it, it was quite desperate wow so like you said when they celebrated that thanksgiving it must have been a true sentiment of, of thanks to have gone through all of that to finally see something begin to turn yeah. uh, in their lifestyle uh, yeah. you've mentioned that uh you, you've spent the past few dozen years promoting the pilgrim fathers as english heroes yes uh, how, why do you see them as English heroes? Because they were English, dear. <laughs> <laughs> they were. They were. But I mean, as far as like what did did something happen in, in England because of them specifically that kind of made things operate and move the way it did? Well, if you look at them, they're the first to really stand up and be counted. You know, we are law English subjects, but mm -hmm. when the king asks us to believe and worship in the way that we don't agree with then mm -hmm. no we can't do that these were if you very much think of it underdogs well, yeah and yeah. english love the underdogs today we love the story of someone <laughs> fighting against the establishment right. and winning but if you look at it right. they became that candle in that darkness that others could follow they had made that step they are often seen as the first congregationalists. The floodgates will open after they have made that stand. We get all the other groups, to, you know, coming about after this. They're that beacon. They're the first. Right. And, you know, if you've got an example to follow, mm -hmm. you're more likely to follow it. It's difficult being the first. So, yes, without them making their stand, maybe we would still be in an England where the monarch has absolute rights. There's only mm -hmm. one church and you have to obey. Right. Right. So, because 
if I'm not mistaken, before that you had uh, the persecutions prior, where they, a lot of them were burnt to stake. That led to uh, was it John Fox's? Is it John Fox Book of Martyrs? Whatever it is. Yes, Acts of Monuments is the correct Acts name, but yes, it's the My Book bad. of Martyrs <laughs> it gets called. Yes, th- yeah. this tells you the horrible, horrible pendulum of events mm. in in England regarding religion. Because you could be burnt as a heretic in the reign right. of Henry for being a Protestant, a proper Protestant, a right. continental style Protestant. You were still considered a heretic. Then in the reign of uh, Edward, mm-hmm. you could be burnt if you were still a Catholic and wanting to hold on to that Catholic faith. Mm-hmm. When we get to Mary, this is where all of those Protestant bishop, ordinary lay people, Ordinary mm. women and men can be burnt at the stake for saying, no, I'm Protestant, I'm not Catholic. Right. And these are the people who are in the Book of Martyrs, those Protestants who refused to be about turned to the mm. Catholic faith. Mm. Awful. And many, many women mm-hmm. amongst see, those yes. burnt. Mm-hmm. Even, so- one, even one pregnant woman was burnt at the stake. <sighs> heavily wow. pregnant and when her child burst forth and it was said it was a fair child it was picked up and they asked what should be done with it mm-hmm. and the bailiff in charge said throw it back into the fire mm. these were horrendous times yes but people would not give up their faith right so so in essence you're saying this, this exodus that started with the separatists those pilgrims led to more leaving yeah. did did that have an effect upon the mindset of the powers that be re- regarding these issues or well it's very hard to uh, shut the floodgates once they've been opened but mm-hmm. of course it's not very long after this that we have the rise of the puritans proper right. the scary puritans yes we have the english civil war mm-hmm and the then king james's son charles having this terrible accident with an axe yes when he lost, lost his, his head, head over it <laughs> <laughs> yes and then the country's ruled by puritans so right. yeah this was the opening of those wow. gates yeah that's quite an effect of course yeah we can i i've looked at i believe it or not i've actually looked through english history at quite a bit of things i'm fascinated with it too Probably not to the level you are with the pilgrims, but <laughs> I am aware of some of the things. Uh, and it's it's interesting because I see the ties, of course, of the yeah. traditions and mentalities we've received here in at the time, the colonies, which would form later yeah. the United States. And the pilgrims are interesting to me as well. But uh, Sue, it's been awesome having you with us today. Uh, won't you take a real quick moment and tell us where we can find your new book, In the Shadows of Men? Well, if you're in the UK, it can be taken uh, by my publisher they they take orders online but in america my books are available from the new england historic genealogical society or american ancestors online shop and they can be ordered easily from there most of my books can be ordered from there so it's been a real pleasure having you today it's been smashing being with you You're listening to Rage of the Age. Rage of the Age. Politics, religion, economics, and history with a conservative bend. Welcome to the essay segment. First of all, I want to wish everyone a happy Thanksgiving for this year. Considering everything we've been through this year, please take the moment to truly give thanks to God for the blessings that we have amongst ourselves and our families as we celebrate this time. But I want to look at another part of the Thanksgiving story, if you will, the the story of the pilgrims who came to the shore at Plymouth Rock in 1620. Many are probably not aware, and well, of course, because this, again, is not taught in our textbooks in school. Why? Because I believe most of them are written by socialists. But there's an element to the story that is um, not many know about, But it's a very important piece of the story that we need to come to grips with and understand that a part of what shaped the American character 
is what happened here in regards to what I'm about to talk about. What is this mystery that most people don't know about the pilgrims and, and that is such has such a profound effect on us as a nation? Well, of course, many might would many would say, well, it's the idea of religious freedom. And I would say, yes, that was their primary drive was to come to a place where they could worship God freely in their own conscience as they saw it in accordance with the scripture and to not have uh, these authorities chasing them down for it. That's absolutely true. But here's the other thing that we gain from them that, again, is not really taught in our schools and should be taught, should absolutely be taught in our schools. When they came here, the system in which they had to operate under was like a socialistic experiment. Their original setup the original setup of the colony was under socialistic principles. There was top-down decision on economic matters, and the labor was assigned. People had to work for a common goal. No one owned their own private property. Everything that was created was centralized and then divvied out as people needed it, and then the rest was sent back to where they had to send it to because they did not have the funds to come. So they tied up with these adventurer companies, as they were called. Uh, these were like these companies that were trying to make money by sending out colonists to these new areas and then getting the wealth back and making a profit off it. Um, they kind of stipulated these terms to where they had to pool their resources and because they, were, they wanted to basically get their cut. And so for the, the agreement was for the first seven years, uh, they would just kind of share everything, and the, and the excess, the profit, had to be sent back to the company, right? Now, I know at this point there's some keen socialists out there waiting and frothing at the mouth to, to jump on something in the story I'm about to share, and that's probably the one thing you jump at. Aha! It was the greedy capitalist who made everything hard in the first place. That's where you're going to go probably, right? But the thing is, is it actually demonstrates why a free and fair market is better than a top-down market. Because what you have here is not an evil, wicked, greedy, capitalistic company, you know, trying to extract from the masses. They, they just didn't understand business very well. That's why they went belly up, by the way, right? They, they didn't exist very, very long. The thing that happened is, is, you had a top-down entity. In fact, they were still echoing the way business had been done for all of uh, medieval history. Uh, the lords basically take the labor of all the uh, peasants and the serfs, and they kind of divvy out to them what they think they should have. Uh, they take the lion's share of the labor. So it, they weren't capitalist in that sense. They were still operating under the idea of the lords get the lion's share, and everybody else just gets the uh, crumbs. Um, so yeah, bad example. If you're going to attack there, they weren't very good capitalists at all. You have an entity with all the power and the control and the money telling you what you can and can't do and that everything you do must prosper them and not you. Now you can argue that that's an evil of capitalism all you want, but in the end, that is exactly what socialism is. Everything is dictated from above. You can't work for yourself. Now, see, if this company had better free enterprising mentality, they would have actually prospered from their venture, as I'm going to show you here in a little bit, but they did not. Again, they went belly up. Therefore, they didn't learn their financial lessons very well. And the market corrects itself and people move on. But here's what really happened in the colony itself with the pilgrims who came to land and to build this new life. So they owe these adventure companies, they have like this debt that they got to pay off, right? The system was made to where this is how they're going to pay it off. But here's the problem. It wasn't working, right? They, as you heard in our interview with Sue Allen, uh, that first winter was horrible. Uh, they finally get to plant some food and they have that, that first Thanksgiving there um, during the harvest, and but the problem is, is um, 
It was a harvest, but it wasn't a great harvest. And the truth is that for the next few years, they would have very tiny harvests. They were barely getting by. With, they have food to eat compared to when they landed. It was a little bit scary. They had food now, but still, they barely had enough to survive, and they were not sending much back at all to these companies who, again, are going to go belly up. So a decision was made in 1623 where William Bradford, the governor of, of uh, Plymouth Rock and, and uh, the, the primary people involved with the decisions of the government there at the time, they decided that they were going to cut off from this commune system because that's what it is, it was a commune, common land. Everybody had to work it. Everybody was divvied out what they were supposed to do. No one could keep the stuff for themselves. Everything that was produced was centrally controlled on who got what, and then it was put away, and they decided to abandon it. Well, why? Well, and this is according to firsthand accounts of William Bradford there. He's the governor. He's, he's the primary runner of this colony, and he's explaining why this thing failed. And here's why. And these are things, notice that what I'm about to say, you've heard these things before. You've heard these explanations before of why socialism doesn't work. Well, these are not new things that angry capitalists just made up because they, they're greedy for their money. These are principles that have been demonstrated through the ages. And here's why the, he explained the, the commune system that they had was failing. Men were getting resentful and fed up that they were working hard where others were not, and they were each getting the same reward. They, everybody got divvy out the exact same stuff, regardless of the labor you put into it. And it was at, a, at this time, many were f complaining that they're ill, they couldn't work. Uh, no one wanted to work for the benefit of others if they were going to get the exact same thing that everyone else was going to get, and not everybody's pitching in to do the work. And every, everyone's trying to basically ditch work as much as possible because they knew the reward was going to be the same whether they did it or not. Now, does that not sound familiar? Of course it does. That's been a complaint from sound-minded economic principles through the ages. And it is one of the first things that is brought up as an argument against socialism and why it does not work. Because in the end, the material that you have, which is not much is produced in such a system, as was the case here, it gets divvied out the same. There's no incentive to make anything more than what you barely have. There's no incentive to work beyond what you can get away with not working. Why should you? And that's the point of it all. They had harvests, but they were very, very small, and by no means because they boast of an overabundance of anything. Because the truth is a socialist system is mainly designed to divvy out what exists, but it does not have a very good capacity in producing anything in meeting the needs of humanity. Now, what was the result? Now, for the first few years, they have this commune system going. They're barely scraping by. They have food to eat, but it's, it's the bare minimum. Everybody's frustrated with everybody else. In 1623, they decide, we're just coming off this thing. And he, what they decide to do is, is um, they give each man his own land and corn to plant and to tend to it, that each, each one will tend to their own and work on it that way. They, so the things were introduced here that were not in the commune system, the socialist experiment, if you will. Now we have private property. Now we have each one putting their hands to their own labor to produce for their own benefit. And what was the result? What was the result of going to this freer market with private property compared to this socialist commune system? In one year, one year, one harvest, basically. So from the time they get their land and they work it, the very first harvest that they get in 1624 is a huge, bountiful harvest. It was so much so that not only did they have plenty of food for themselves to eat, they were able to export, export 
a full boat of corn, excess corn. And with that, they were able to settle their debts with those adventure companies. And they even were so successful with this model that they purchased stock in the colony so that they could have ownership of it. And they basically changed the whole system from this commune idea to this free enterprise system, what we know as capitalism. That's interesting. I mean, think about that. When people are allowed to operate in a freedom to earn their own income, in just one year, what could be accomplished rather than waiting on some system to divvy it out to everybody equally? That's the key difference between capitalism and socialism. Socialism is obsessed with who gets what. Capitalism is what makes the stuff that you can even obsess about exist. It is a far better system because it allows each person to create and enjoy the blessings of their labor. Whereas in socialism, you take everybody's blessings and divvy it out in parcels. And, then no, and, and everyone's frustrated with every one another. No one wants to work because they're not going to benefit by it. Why would they? It's a form of slavery, really. Now, the, the keen thing to look at as well is, is with the pilgrims here, they learned from their mistake, and they changed it. And the reason is is because they had another concept going in their minds, this whole idea of rule by consent of the governed, right? That, you know, they, there, there was a democratic nature to their form of government. They, it wasn't William Bradford made all the decisions. There was no top-down government. It was ruled by consent of the people. And the consent was, is we're tired of living this way. It needs to change. And so they learned their lesson. And they escaped from it and adopted a freer economy. But that is why you will see in social systems that they must have an element of force in order to stay in existence. Because those who live under socialism for any length of time, they each come to the conclusion this isn't working and we need to step out of this. But socialist systems have a counter to that. It's called raw force. Uh, you're not allowed. You, you, because if, if they don't get everybody chipping in, then they don't have these little trinkets to pass out to people. And if people decide to leave that system and they prosper, well, it makes you look bad. That's why force is always a part of the socialist ethic. You have to make people work in order to have labor. Why? Because you remove the incentive for them to work in the first place that would naturally exist under a capitalistic system. Force always has to exist with socialism. This is something that has been built into the American character from the very beginning, ruled by the consent of the people. And it's not because the pilgrims invented this. These are ideas they in, that they inherited from Magna Carta and other things from England at the time. So when they came over, they actually put it into practice, whereas back in the home country, you had uh, aristocrats who really didn't believe in that sort of thing for the common people. They had no idea of really the free market either. Um, but here it was allowed to actually take root and to prosper. And it did. To have a bumper crop in a year to where you can pay off your debts and buy the company, that speaks volumes. When other colonists came to Massachusetts, all those colonies, like especially from Boston, they were referred to Plymouth as the model. Copy them and what they did. And what were they copying? Rule by consent of the people, free market, private ownership of land, keeping what you own. And, and, and it created a sudden burst of economic activity, a, a burst of blessings. Wow, when you're allowed to actually make stuff for yourself and profit for yourself and, and keep the rewards, look what can happen. That's why those colonies began to, to flourish, whereas before, with these top-down methods of trying to manage economic activity, were failing in other places, here, they were prospering. And it would become known that people would prosper better in the colonies than they would in the home world. 
that they had their own land. They were eating better. They were gaining their own wealth. Things were changing because of this concept of liberty and free enterprise where you can benefit by the labor of your hands and actually be rewarded for it. And that, in essence, is the hidden story of the pilgrim story and that Thanksgiving and everything else that we think about about this time of year. What we do learn and should learn are those lessons that they learned very early on and applied them, and it did become a part of our American DNA, that you should have a right to benefit by your labor, that we are to have a rule by consent of the people, and that we deserve to enjoy the blessings of the liberty that our own hands have created and to not have other people come around and snatch it from us. That is the basis upon which this nation was built. And it should stay that way as a basis. You've been listening to Rage of the Age. If you love today's podcast, make sure to leave a review on the media you're listening through. Secure future episodes by heading over to rageoftheage.com and clicking the RSS feed button. Until next time, this has been Rage of the Age.